Luke, Luke approached you about coming here. What drew you to this concert? Luke. <laughs> Simple as that. Great opportunity to play it. Uh, not playing, but you know, working on Sundays. That was pretty cool. Uh, but obviously we have a relationship with Coach Fick and the way that he does things, the way that he pushes people, uh, the way that he challenges you as a coach, the way that he cares for the kids, um, and always keeps our student athletes first. I think that's what's most important. It was pretty good for my family. You know, I'd be remiss if I didn't say Amy does a really good job of taking care of everybody's family and supporting us. But um, yeah, if you want the straightforward answer, Luke, that was probably it. Yeah. It's kind of going off that. How does the familiarity help with you guys? Because a lot of you guys have worked with each other before. Yeah, it helps out because you understand the do's and don'ts, not only of defense, but of how people are. You know, the comfort of knowing their families and being around their families and, and uh, getting around people who you know and who know you uh, and who knows you. I think that makes it a little bit easier for from a transition perspective. But we still have to learn the student athletes, right? So the families are great and that stuff is cool, but it's more important um, for us to use that kind of cohesion to kind of bring the student athletes along with us to let them know that, man, we're all in this together in some way, shape, or form. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think my initial impressions of them are the same ones that I think a lot of people have. They play extremely hard. Uh, I was out on the road recruiting and uh, had a coach, I won't say from what school, to protect him. Uh, but he, he said that they were one of the t toughest D-lines that they played. Um, they were scared to play those guys. Again, I won't say who, but I felt like that was respectful um, of those guys, indicative of it. I think for me, there's a couple things that I want to get our guys to do. Um, that we've been working on making a tremendous kind of strides on here, um, you know, and, and want to make tremendous strides on during the spring. But to say I know exactly who they are, um, uh, it'd be a little difficult right now. Uh, I got a better answer for you after the spring. And I, and I, I, I just want to say this, I'm going to pride myself on being like the transparent coach, you know, just because why not? You know what I mean? Like, I'm going to ask the same thing for y'all. As long as Brian lets me. Um, nah, I'll go to as far as he lets me. But, uh, but yeah, once I get to the spring, man, ask me again, and I'll tell you straight up what I think, you know what I mean, and, and, and where I think they are. But I will say this. I don't think there are many people who play harder. I don't think there are many people out there who are yearning more to continue to grow and get better than a group in my room. And I can say that confidently. Um, and that makes it easy for me as a coach to show up every day right and work with them some guys have made some plays but i think we have a lot more that we can make just from what i've seen the little bit of that i've seen uh, but i got to study a little bit more you know you mentioned your relationship with fickle but i'm sure you've been asked this before but a long time ago your high school coach convinced you to come out and play ball when you were in the band and playing groups can you take share that story about what pitch he gave you and how that has affected your life and where you are today. Yeah, so Steve Speck, I always want to make sure I say him by name. Yeah. Steve Speck, Coach goes. I love him. Um, I think the the elevator version of that story essentially is he knew that I was a basketball player and I wanted to I wanted to try to play basketball in college and make, make my life that way. Mm -hmm. um, but then secondary to that, he knew that I did, I did not want my mother to pay a, a dollar for me to go to school, right? And so um, however that was going to happen, um, I planned on going to the military, flying C-130s, retiring from the military, and then being a Delta pilot for the rest of my life. Okay. Um, he just said, you know, if you give me a chance, you know, I could help you. I didn't want to look back on my life and wonder what would have happened if I ever played football. So I said, Coach, I'm going to do it because, I, you know, um, I, I do it because, uh, you know, I'm going to try and get scholarship. He's all right, you got to do more than that because obviously as a coach, I see it now, you achieve the scholarship, you lose your burn. Mm -hmm. So you got to give me more than that. And I, I mean this to this day. I said, coach, I want to play for you. I don't think it took much more to sell him after that. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, kind of steer your roll downhill from there. First, first game scholarship and then you know, the blessings continued to roll after that. Did so, you have any idea back then it would lead to as much as it did? I did not. I, I, again, I simply wanted to pay for school. That okay. was the only thing that was important to me was to make sure I could get a degree and put myself in a position to go get a, a nine to five. Mm -hmm. But obviously leading to 
playing on Sundays. Um, Coach Clint Hurt, who's the defensive coordinator with the Seahawks now, um, he came in, and it wasn't that Coach Delgado and Coach English didn't believe in me before, but he came in, and from day one when he took the job, said, you can play in the NFL. I'm telling you, you can. Gained 20 pounds, then that happened. Then playing in the NFL, and that leading to the opportunity to give back two guys, um, and young men and young student athletes, both male and female, doesn't really matter. That's been super cool. Um, I did not anticipate it. I didn't. Uh, I just I wanted to go to school for free, man. And that was that was it. That was it. For, in terms of recruiting, I know that there was you know a big win for signing day with Jamal Howard, but overall, just your <coughs> for recruiting for the defensive line. You know, Howard, you, with your NFL pedigree, being in the college, how within the scheme, what's going to be your approach with recruiting defensive linemen for the program? Making me give away my secret sauce. <laughs> um, no, I think I, it's not just D-line. It's any position I recruit. Um, and anybody can know this. When I say I ain't playing, I ain't playing. I build off of relationships. I recruit everybody off of a relationship. I don't care how good of a player you are. I don't. It doesn't matter to me what the stars say. I, I don't care. When it comes to getting a defensive lineman in this program, it's going to be having a guy that wants to play for a coach that cares for him, that's going to develop him as a person and as a student athlete, um, a, a defensive lineman that knows they're going to play for a coach that they can call 20 years from now. Um, I tell every defensive lineman, I don't care about the draft party. Don't invite me. Not important to me. Do that for somebody else. And if you're going to play for me, if you're going to get married, I better get a wedding invitation. Uh, you graduate, I better get an invitation to the graduation party. You have a first child or whatever the case may be, I better get a picture. Those are the types of things that are important to me. Am I going to be able to make you a pretty good football player? I would like to believe so within my, you know, uh, parameters, obviously. Um, I'd like to see, I'd like to think that my opportunity to be able to coach on Sundays has helped out a lot, you know. Um, I'm going to drop a couple names that I can pick up real quick, but if I decide to call Quentin Williams and you want to ask him if I helped him, I think he vouched for me. If you want to call Aaron Whitecott, defensive line coach in, uh, in New York, and ask him if, I, if he thought that I had the pedigree to be able to teach and train good young men, that's cool, but that's not what I'm going to recruit on. I recruit purely, purely off of my relationship with my kids because the way that I see it is that if I can get you um, to trust me, I can get you to do a lot of things that I ask you to do. If you don't trust me off the field, then trying to get you to do anything on the field won't happen, and vice versa, right? If I don't trust you, I'm not going to believe that if I coach you to do something that you'll actually do it on Saturday and I can actually get the most out of you. I can't. So we have to build the, re the relationship with one another and understand that over the course of time of recruiting, I'm not just calling you to tell you, man, how good you are or see when I can get you on campus. I want to know you. Sometimes I'll call a kid and I just tell him, hey, listen, don't talk to me about football, I'm gonna hang up on you. <laughs> like, tell me about something that happened in history class today or math class. I remember last year, a kid I recruited, I was working through Pythagorean theorems on the board with him. Don't really care. I just wanna know you. Um, I get long winded because there's a lot of people out here. <laughs> anyway, Coach, naturally with the NFL season, you, got, you were one of the later highs. Just what was the timeline like of? jumping into recruiting and then just kind of, uh, yeah, just jumping into recruiting and then getting to know the guys after that. Yeah, that's very simple. Uh, we played the Miami Dolphins on January 8th. January 9th, I was in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, that Thursday, which whatever day that was, that Thursday I was in Chicago. Quick. <laughs> I mean, it was quick. I got in, I had almost 100 guys to watch or something like that to try to get up to speed. Um, but, you know, it's part of it. It was a quick transition. It was a little difficult for sure, just trying to do everything the best of your ability, you know. But, um, you know, I think we got caught up and we got a great team of people around, you know, Pat and Max and those guys um, have really, Casey, I don't want to let rid of him, and Slick Rick, they all kind of got me together. Oh, sorry, John Richter, I call him Slick Rick. Um, they they, they kind of got me together to help me out, man. So. They made it as, 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 as painless as possible, even though it was a quick, quick turnaround. And just to clarify, was the agreement made like during week 18 or week before? Or? Uh, no, the agreement wasn't made probably um, until the last, probably the last week. Okay. You know, it's a very difficult decision, if I may say so myself, leaving the National Football League and being able to coach those guys. Um, so, you know, you had to sit on it a little bit. And uh, for me, I, I can only work one thing at a time. 
we were trying to go to the playoffs, man. And we were trying to go continue to win games. And so I was more focused on trying to make sure that those guys were prepared and making sure that I was giving everything to that organization to make sure that we could put ourselves in the best position to win. So it was really late decision because, you know, that's why it was such a late hire, you know. But um, I'm, I'm thankful that I did make it because ultimately I think in the moment it would be pretty good. In what ways do you feel like you grew as a coach during your one season? Well, I think the attention to detail that you have to, to prepare for a game, right? Every game matters. And so you can take no time off. You, you don't have a slacker game, if you will. Um, the attention to detail that it takes to prepare. Uh, Coach White Cotton does a really good job uh, of managing a room. You know, one of the things I was most curious about was how do you manage a room full of guys who are making, you know, 15 million. That's where he sat in the front right here. He's making 15 million. He's got 55 million on his contract. That's fourth overall right there, third overall set right there, or whatever the case may be. Um, but he did a really good job of showing me some ways on how to manage a room, you know, full of guys who could potentially have egos. Fortunately, we had a bunch of a group full of good guys. Um, I think Coach Ulbrich, uh, if I may say his name, Jeff Ulbrich, does a really good job um, of how he prepares day in and day out for us, relying on his assistance to coach, being able to delegate the work that's necessary um, to put us in the best position. I think the proof is in the pudding. We went from, I think, bottom whatever it was, bottom 30, you know, 31, 32 in the league in defense or 30th in the league in defense to top five in almost every statistical category across the board. You know, so I think the attention to detail to prepare, the way that you can manage a room and talk to the young man, you know, or men, but particularly here, the young student athletes, um, and then all, all the different questions that you ask to, to kind of get solutions to problems. You know, it's not just, you know, plain cut and dry, man. It is like, you know, chop it up a little bit, chop it up a little bit more, okay, refit it, shape it, all right, chop it up a little bit more. I mean, you just constantly are digging and digging and digging until you get to something that feels most comfortable, which is why I understand the margin of winning in the NFL, regardless of what the score may say, is always just that close because I see what people are doing every day. And I hope to bring that same type of attention to detail here and how we prepare, not only from a defensive perspective, Coach Coach Fick does a great job of asking those same types of questions, which is why I love it. But, um, you know, in my role and how I prepare my guys, I like to think we'll be the most prepared in the country. And I'm not just saying that as uh, like clickbait or however you want to call it, press talk. I truly mean that um, because I was I had a chance to be trained by the best and study under the best um, for a good period of time every day. What you know what they were doing here last year and what you know Coach Fickle and you guys want to do with your defensive line, how much crossover is there from what they, what's been here and what you guys want to do? As a defensive line coach, I always say it this way, man. It, there, there, there will always be crossover because we can only go three ways as a defensive line. Okay? <laughs> Straight, left, or right. Like, man, let's, <laughs> let's not make this game complicated, right? So um, there will always be carryover from the front perspective in the sense that, man, listen, whether we play on the outside shade as a heavy five, a regular five, or inside shade as a four eye or a two eye, we do that. So I think there will be some carryover. You obviously don't want to take away what they did well, um, but you also want to continue to bring what we do well. You know what I mean? So what that looks like, how that looks like, I have absolutely no clue. That's what we're trying to work through right now. Um, but I think we will carry a little bit uh, of what made both of us successful and do our best to try to blend that, you know, as best we can, you know? Greg, you yeah. alluded to them earlier about the recruiting staff. Just what has that recruiting staff done since you've been here that stood out and just how they interact with, with the coaching staff? Too? Yeah, well, I think that we – we get after it, you know, those guys really get after it. Pat, Max, Molly Maul, sorry, Molly, uh, Rotten House, um, but Pat, Max, Molly, Casey, John, um, they really do a great job of, one, keeping the young kids in front of you, but keeping a relationship with us and keeping us up to, up to speed on where those guys are, you know? Talking to a guy, not talking to a guy, parents, high school coach, those types of things that kind of get lost while we're trying to build up a defense and reestablish ourselves within the program. I think um, they, and the energy that they bring every single day, you know, when they come into the office, every single last one of them have energy and juice every single day to make us enthusiastic about the potential kids that we could probably get here on campus. And I think that feeds not only into the building, but that feeds out into um, out into the kids that we're recruiting as well. So um, my hat's off to them because they don't sleep that much. They really don't. Um, they do a really good job. And again, I. I said whenever I got a microphone in front of me, I would always give 
people credit by name. So Molly, John, Pat, Max, Casey, uh, they do a really good job.